Okay, in our previous tutorial, we demonstrated how to create a netlist and how to import it um, to the board file. Let's assume that this is the circuit we are working on. Here you can see the USB connector and differential pair, which is going to this chip. These eight pins, data pins, and four control lines here all go to the controller. The controller is powered by using a 9 volt input that is converted to 5 volt using a regulator. We've already created a netlist using the generate netlist option. From our netlist we have imported all the components in um, the board file. These are all the components from the schematic we have set all the rules, such as track widths and vias we will require. Right now the grid is set to 50 mils, but while doing the placement, it should be at five mils, which is normally the grid setting. But before doing the placement, we need the board outline defining the edges of the board. So let's keep the grid at 100 mils so it's easy to draw the outlines. We have selected a 62 mil thick four layer board. Layer two is ground, layer three is power, and top and bottom are signal layers. In net classes, we have set the differential pair widths and gaps to eight mils. There are two types of power, USB power and regulator power. And we have set all the different net tracks over here. We have set the solder mass clearance to zero. We're now good to go with the placement. Before getting started with the placement, it's necessary to draw the board edge. On the right hand side, click add graphic lines. Now you can see all the board layers. Select the edge cuts layers. You need to draw the exact board edge that will be cut during the manufacturing. So you have selected the edge cuts layer and the grid at 100 mils. Now click the screen and start drawing. Make sure your line is straight. You now have defined the borders. This will be your actual PCB. Now you need to set the origin on the bottom left of the board. Go to place, select grid origin, and place it at the bottom left corner. The first placement task is placing the mounting holes. There are four mounting holes in this schematic, H1, H2, H3, and H4. Let's go back to the board to begin the placement. There are two ways to find components. You can press key T on your keyboard and a pop-up will appear. Type your component name or select it from the list. Change the grid to five mils. Press key M and place the mounting hole in the corner. We are randomly placing this M1, but mounting holes should have fixed locations. And repeat this with uh, three other mounting holes. Once placed, the mounting holes shouldn't move. Click and select the footprint option. Now right click and select locking and lock. The mounting hole is fixed. If you try to move it, a pop-up will warn you about the locked item. Another way to find your component is to press key uh, control S. Type the name and the component will be highlighted. If you want to select it, press key T. You can now put all components outside of the board to place them one by one. You can see there are many good connections. If you find it confusing, 
you could turn off these wires. Go to view, click show rat's nest, and the wires will disappear. We prefer to keep them as they indicate the connections. The next step is to place the connectors. Always refer to your schematic while doing the placement. This is the 9 volt jack connector, which is the J1 connector. And we want to place it first. Let's go to the board again, press key T, and type J1. Once J1 is selected, press key R if you want to rotate it and place it. After placing the connectors, it is best to practice to lock them. Right click, choose locking, and lock. Again, always refer to your schematic while doing the placement. You can see that there are capacitors connected to 5 volts traces. We have placed these capacitors on the side of the schematic so this doesn't get too congested. These capacitors will be placed at the output of the regulator. And these two capacitors are used as decoupling capacitors for pins 7 and 20 of the micro microcontroller. This capacitor will be placed at the output pin of this regulator. And the surge suppressor needs to be placed near the connector because um, it is used to suppress any surge voltage coming into the circuit. Now search for D2. Press R to rotate it and place it right here. Let's zoom in a bit. As you can see, you just have to go with the flow on the schematic. Let's now place the capacitor C1, which will be at the input pin of the regulator. Find C1 first and place the regulator near this capacitor, or place the regulator first and, and place the capacitor near to this pin. Select the regulator first, rotate it and place it here. Now C1. Search C1 and place it close to this pin. And you can see this is the input pin for your regulator and we have placed the capacitor close to this pin. This is how you can do the complete placement. While following the schematic, remember that you have to keep your power, analog, and digital sections separate so that they don't interfere. This is the complete placement of the circuit. As you can see, this is the J1 connector. This is the suppressor. This is the capacitor close to this pin. C2 is at the output of the regulator, and there is C7 here. This is the electrolytic capacitor, and this is C2, which is at the output of the regulator. You can see this flow. The input is coming from here to there. The output is generating from here and is going into this component. There were two capacitors, one near the pins 7 and 20. Place the capacitor close to the input pins. And there is one more capacitor which is placed over here. This is pin 21. You can see this connection. Both are the same nets. So these two capacitors are placed close to the pins. The next step is the placement of the crystal. It is best to place the crystal as close as possible to the micro crystal input pins. These two pins are nothing but crystal input pins. This is the crystal and there are two capacitors. There are two capacitors connected to the 16 megahertz crystal. Those should be close to the crystal. And you can see there are three more connectors in the circuit. Here you have the first connector, second connector, and third connector. All of these lines are input output pins of the regulator. If we connect this pin over here, it won't be a problem. It'll work. But if you connect this over here, then the two connections will overlap each other and it will create problems while routing. To avoid this, it is recommended to pre-plan your connections so that when you place your components, it won't affect your routing. This is the USB section. These are the three connectors we were talking about, J3, J4, and J5. The USB connector consists of six pins, but the pin number six is common for two pins of the shield of the connector. 
There are also voltage suppressors for the two differential pair inputs, and one is synced to the main supply voltage, V bus. These three should be close to the connector so that it doesn't allow the unwanted voltage to enter into the circuit. And we have these two resistors. This particular connection is important. This is a differential pair working at a high frequency at around 12 megahertz. This differential pair should be routed properly with proper length matching, meaning the skew should be minimum between the two lengths. This is an important parameter to consider while placing. Place it in such a way that this particular point and this particular point are both face to face so they so that that it's easy to route them. This is the USB connector and these two pins are differential pair inputs. One pin is going over here. This is a surge suppressor right after the connector. And this is another trace. This is also a suppressor right after the input. And here, this pin is VCC, which is also going to my surge suppressor. You need to place the surge suppressor first, and after that, the differential pair, so it would be in a straight line. These two lines are going through the surge suppressor to the two resistors. The next step is to follow the sequence of the supply voltage. Before coming into the circuit, the V-bus needs to go through this surge suppressor. Then, this capacitor should be close to the V-bus before going into the ferrite. After that, we want to place the capacitor C13 over there, and C11 and C10 over there by pins 3 and 26. This is a capacitor right after the surge suppressor. It is going to the ferrite bead, and after, it should go to the capacitor. And from there, you can see this particular capacitor over here, which was going to one of the inputs is going over there. Similarly, this is one capacitor over here, which is placed close to this. And we can figure out two more components over here. This is a resistor and this is a capacitor. You can see the two points. This is R4 and this is C8. R4 is taking from VCC and is giving to AVCC. But before going to AVCC, it should first pass through C8. This is a capacitor and this is a resistor. This point is coming through VCC. Through this capacitor and into the input of the microcontroller. You need to follow the circuit. Once the placement is finalized, everything is properly maintained as per your requirements. You can start routing. Before routing, let's take a look at these three circles. These are called fiducials. Fiducials are normally not connected in the circuit, but they are required as a reference during manufacturing to indicate the proper orientation of the board. It will also help the proper placement of the components. The most critical tracks in this design are the differential pair over here. We need to make sure they are routed properly and are separated by any other high frequency signal. But if there are multiple differential pairs, at least 5W should be the spacing of the differential pair or any other analog signal. 5W is five times the width of the differential pair. Let's start by planning the layers. In the stack up, we have used layer one and layer four as signal layers, which will be used for proper track routing. And layer two and three are power planes, so they won't have any tracks. We will fill the complete area with copper. Layer two will be ground, so we can route the differential pair on the first layer. And even then, after the first layer, the reference for the differential pair should be ground. We need to make sure that the differential tracks are covered by the reference ground over their entire length. There shouldn't be any cut in layer two. If there's a discontinuity, the overall impedance of the 90 ohm differential pair will mismatch and it might affect the signals. Let's place our plane layers. There are two types of grounds here. There's the GND for ground and then there's the GND PWR for ground power, which are connected to the shield of the USB connector. We will require two types of planes, which is ground and ground power. 
but this ground power is not going anywhere in the circuit. In layer two, we will pour ground for only this portion and we will keep the remaining portion in the ground. For pouring ground on the right hand side, there's an option called add filled zones. Click where you want to start. A window pops up with various nets. Select which net you want to pour. We will select the ground power and indicate on which layer we want to pour, which is layer two. You can see the clearance is 20 mils. So when you pour, there will be a distance of 20 mils from any other component in the circuit. For corner smoothing, select chamfer and mention five mils. So when you draw a square or rectangle with 90 degree angles, it will automatically make them 45 degrees with a chamfer of five mils. Click OK and draw your shape while making sure to do a complete loop. This portion over here is connected over here, but it's not completely. This is basically a thermal connection. To make it solid, go to Copper Zone Properties and, as pad connections, choose Solid. Now it is completely connected, and we have poured this ground. If you select on the right-hand side GND or Layer 2, you can see the poured layer. The next step is to pour the remaining portion with your component ground. So repeat, but this time choose the ground net. There's a pin over here for ground, which is why we're taking it this inside. Right now, it is selected in the top layer, so we will change it to the ground layer. And let's save the file. We will also have to pour the ground layers, one coming from the regulator and one coming from the USB. In this portion, there will be VCC, and we can use the remaining portion of the plus 5V. That will be in layer 2. Now, let us see in the differential pair. We will route the differential pair first. It is already defined in the schematic that this is D plus and D minus. You need to set up certain rules. Here, we have set the differential tracks and spacing as 8 mils. Now let's start a routing. Go to route at the top and choose differential pair. As you can see, the line on the top layer is not above the ground plane, so we will have to adjust that layer. You can see the tracks are above the ground on layer two. And one more thing you need to make sure of is that all the tracks have an equal length. For that, go to Route and click Tune Differential Pair Skew slash Phase. You can see the skew is too short. This line needs to be shorter than its partner. Before doing so, right click and select Length Tuning Setting where you can rectify the length. The spacing between the differential pair is set up to eight mils. So make the minimum space eight mils as well. The spacing should be three times the width, so 24 mils. Once you're done, drag your cursor over the differential pair, and if the tuned skew is green, the tracks have equal length. Repeat this action for all the pairs you have. Now, we will show you the completed design. Here is the completed design. You can see over here, this differential pair we have already routed. When we click it, it's saying that it's tuned. The differential routing is done.